Good morning. Morning. <laughs> Welcome to Real Life Silver Valley. It's wonderful to see you folks this morning. Go ahead and stand with us if you are able. And we are going to start off praising our God, our God together. All right, here we go. I'm losing sight of all that matters, blinded by questions I can't answer. I'm paralyzed by what I don't know. Doubt holds me hostage and won't let go. Breathe out, breathe in, raise my hands and remember, you're the one, you're the one who makes mountains move. Stars will not shine on Good morning. How you doing, lifers? Good. My name's Brian. I'm uh, part of our men's ministry. I uh, just want to say welcome to Real Life. Um, there is a ton of stuff going on uh, here at the church. So I'm not going to cover any specific announcements this morning, but I would direct you uh, just to the bulletin. Um, that's where you're going to get all your information about men's, women's, home groups, leadership trainings, membership classes, uh, children's ministry, youth, everything going on in the church, either there or on our website. Um, so just make your way there. And then in that bulletin, if you're new with us, uh, that's going to have your sermon notes. Uh, there's a connection card in there. If you want to fill that out, drop it in the back uh, just to let us know you're here. Uh, we're not going to come knocking on your door. Um, we just want to send you some stuff and say, thanks for coming. Here's what our church is about. Um, and uh, or you can do that online uh, through the app. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to keep it short and sweet uh, this morning. I I know that some of you laborers out there, who's in the construction field? Raise your, throw a hand up. We got some guys in the construction. So I know right now you being here Sunday 
with a thousand projects looming over your head is a big deal. So I just want to say thanks for taking time out and uh, worshiping the Lord with us this morning. He'll, uh, he'll bless you for that. I'm going to pray, and we'll do a quick uh, meet and greet, and then we'll continue in our, in our worship through singing, uh, and then also hearing a sermon, taking communion, and then get you guys out of here. Let's pray. Father, thanks for uh, just the gift of this morning. Thanks for our church that we can gather freely, Lord. I know it's not the case in a lot of parts of the world. Um, but we can come together and, and, and worship you and give you thanks. Uh, Lord, thank you for the fellowship of your spirit. Thank you for uh, the truth of the Bible and the scriptures that you've preserved and handed down to us, Lord, so we can know uh, truth from lies in a, in a culture that just seems like truth is shifting on a daily basis, Lord, and uh, morality is being twisted and um, just, just evil uh, out there, Lord, but we can be grounded on your word and, and have your spirit inside of us to remind us of what truth is. Uh, Lord, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for the gift uh, of the truth that Jesus uh, died for our sins and he rose from the dead three days later. Um, so we just celebrate that this morning and that's why we gather. Thanks for calling us out of, out of darkness and, and into light and into your family, Lord. Um, we are grateful. Uh, help us to worship you well today by singing and by listening to the sermon. Amen. All right, greet somebody, uh, maybe say hi to somebody you haven't seen before or somebody you haven't seen in a couple weeks because I know it's been a busy summer. We are going to continue with our worship as you make your way back to your seat. Are you giving any announcements? 
your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 open the eyes of my heart lord open the eyes of my heart i want to see you i want to see you
Savior, He is. Lord God, you are our friend and our Abba Father. Lord, we just come before you this morning and we just offer up our voices in sweet harmony and melody, Lord, to you, our Abba Father. I pray, Lord, that we would just remember that we can take all of our anxieties and all of our stuff and just lay it at your feet. We love you in your precious, precious name. Amen. Amen. Love that song. 
Can have a seat, everybody. How are you? Good morning. I see people are doing the Sunday squeeze. Like, I like it. The room's filling up. That's awesome. Hey, before we, uh, if you, and if you don't know me, I'm Kevin Kessler, associate pastor here. You can call me Rev Kev. That's one of my nicknames. I like it. Thanks, thanks, Will Yergler. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm really happy you're here. You could be many places on a beautiful Sunday morning in North Idaho in September, and God drew you here. So I know he has something for you this morning in his word. Um, before we, every, every service, we do a directed prayer time for a few minutes just to get us ready for uh, the message and getting into the word. But I wanted to highlight one thing. So if you look on your bulletins, if you can pull them out for the married couples here in the room and those watching, um, and if you guys mind, if you can throw, I think there's a slide up there for the marriage conference. We are hosting a marriage conference uh, here at this church in October. Um, the main, there's going to be a few different speakers, but Chris and Sarah Short are coming over from Real Life Post Falls. I know them both. Uh, they are great people, very authentic. And uh, so Chris is the executive pastor over there, and then his wife Sarah uh, is the women's discipleship leader. And here's what I want to encourage you with. So my wife and I, uh, Nicole, man, I married up. Um, <laughs> we've been married 19 years, 20 this March. And with that, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm telling you it's because of God's grace and because of people that have invested in our relationship. So I remember the first time uh, we were going to a conference. It was the, um, the one they hosted at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. I'm, of course, can't think of the name of it. There we go. Weekend to remember. And it, it was just such a shot in the arm. And it wasn't like we were struggling, but man, does every marriage need some help? Absolutely. And so this is what I want you to think about married couples. This is for anyone. If you've been married six months, if you've been married 20 years, if you've been married 30 years, go get some encouragement, get some, just some uh, equipping. And this is not just going to be just, we called it in the army death by PowerPoint. <laughs> No, this is going to be interaction. There's going to be um, a lot of just, you know, things that you can do, homework. But I just really want to encourage you to attend, and I hope this place fills up. Sound good? Okay. Well, I, we're going to just spend a few time, a few minutes just to go through some time of directed prayer. And uh, if you guys can put the, just those points up on the screen. Thank you, thank you. Here's what I want to encourage you with. Um, something I, I was reminded of before Thursday service is we should pray more than we talk about it. So I'm going to just be silent. I'm going to let you go into the throne room. You can do that as a believer. And I just want you to, maybe there's one of these points that stick out to you. Maybe you, you are just struggling this morning. Or Jesus meets you right where you're at. He's going to give you grace and mercy in your time of need. Maybe there's someone that's just on your heart. We're going to talk about um, our vision and mission today, about reaching the world for Jesus one person at a time. Maybe there's someone that's just on your heart you need to pray for. Maybe you need to start with that first one. What are you thankful for? So I'm going to be, uh, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit work in your heart and let you pray. I'll pray for the service and we will jump in. So let's, let's as a, just a church family, just spend a few minutes praying. Lord God, I'm so thankful that we can come to you at any time and at any place. You meet us right where we're at, Lord. Um, on those days where 
we're just struggling, if it's just an emotional struggle, a relational hurt, a, a sin that has just tripped us up again. And God, on those days where, man, we are just riding that wave of, of your goodness, of your blessings, and I pray, Lord, that we're reminded uh, about your grace, that on our bad days, on our worst days, God, we're never beyond the reach of your grace. And on those good days where I know in my life maybe some of that pride or self-righteousness starts to well up, that we're never beyond the need of your grace. And so, Lord God, I pray this morning as we open up your word, as we talk about um, what your word is for our life right now, that application piece, um, that we would have hearts that are soft and willing to receive your word. Uh, Lord, I know there's some here this morning that are questioning who you are. Maybe they don't have that abiding relationship with you. They haven't accepted you, Lord, into their life and, and chose to follow you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to them this morning, um, that they would know that you are for them. And God, I, I just pray that uh, as we open up your word, I would speak clearly, I would speak your truth, um, that you would do a work in our hearts. Um, I thank you, God, for just as Brian said that we can freely meet this morning, I pray that we never, ever take that for granted. And Lord, I just lift up your church, especially in those parts of the world where they are under true persecution. Uh, Lord, that you would absolutely uh, strengthen them and help them, Lord, to persevere. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, if you want to open up your Bibles, I love hearing paper pages turn in church. It's good. If you want to pull out your sermon notes, uh, use your app. And if you want to turn to Mark chapter 9, and we're going to start here in a few moments in verse 42. So as you're turning there, um, as you can see on the screen, Yes, we are still in the book of Mark. I think this is week 35, but taking a journey um, each week as we take a chunk of, of the scriptures in Mark and, and just look through them and, and see how we can um, just learn from Jesus. The focus here on this series is to focus on the teachings and the life of Jesus so we can learn to be a disciple of Jesus in our culture. Um, last week, just a quick recap and a little bit of context, uh, Pastor Gene preached a great sermon. It was Mark 9, 30 through 41. And a few kind of takeaway points, just to remind us. He spoke about how Jesus is the ultimate servant teacher. He, there was a lesson there about greatness, a lesson about humble service, and a lesson about humility. In my opinion, I think a disciple of Jesus, that should be a core attribute as someone who is humble. So this week, I've titled the sermon, Sin, Salvation, and Salt. I hope that piques your curiosity. <laughs> and uh, we're going we're gonna to really dive into this today. And, and real quick, we can be honest in church, right? So <laughs> I was talking with somebody before service, and they're like, oh, I bet you were, you know, prepped for this a while ago. And I tend to, I try to do that, Brian. <laughs> and uh, yes. Here's what happened, though. I was going a certain direction, and God stopped me. And he said, okay, that's decent, but I want you to go this way. So I, I rewrote the whole sermon. But I, I do believe that there's a really good message here for, for each and every one of us. And um, I just pray that you're hungry to, to hear it today. So if you're able to, uh, physically, if you can stand with me while I read God's word. Uh, just something we like to do in our church, just to honor the word. Feel free at home, do the same thing. <laughs> and so I'm going to start in the end, verse 42 of Mark 9. If anyone casts one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? 
have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. And that's the word of God. You can have a seat. Jesus uses some strong language there, doesn't he? You're probably wondering, man, this is going to be an interesting sermon. <laughs> so we're going to dive into this. Um, first, something that I just, it helps me when I read the word is I love to get context. So, okay, where did this happen as we read this scripture? It's Capernaum. So I'm going to have a few pictures for you today. Um, if you guys can throw that map up on there. So Capernaum, it's the, it was a fishing village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, a little bit of the stuff I found, about 15, they estimate about 15,000 people lived there at this time. And it's really interesting if you look into Jesus' three and a half year public ministry. 85% of his ministry was in a 12 square mile area around this northern shore of Galilee. It's kind of interesting to me. Um, a little bit more here. Okay, with whom does this take place? And oh, one more thing. Sorry, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. If you guys go to the next picture. Also, if we look, if you look at Mark 9.33 and Mark 1.24, during this conversation, they are likely, I'm not saying 100%, but from what I see personally, they're likely in Peter and Andrew's home when this conversation takes place. Kind of a cool little recreation of maybe what that looked like at the time. And then I'm, uh, this next picture, I love biblical archaeology, especially where the word says there's a town here and people are like, no, there's not. And they dig a little deeper and they go, oh, uh, interesting. So this is actually a first century home um, there in Capernaum. Not saying this was Peter and Andrew's house. Don't hear me say that. But it's just right where the word says there's these homes, they're finding homes. Just, just love that. A little bit of evidence for you. Um, I always love that. So who, who is in this conversation? Well, if you look back to Mark 9.35 and Mark 9.36, Jesus is talking to his 12 apostles. We see that. It's very clear. However, there appears to me to be some others in attendance because we see where Jesus takes a child. So there, there's someone else there, too. Um, it's a continuation of a conversation that already started because last week, as Gene uh, went through earlier in Mark chapter 9, do you remember what the disciples were arguing about? Who's the greatest? Yeah, interesting. And, and, and check out that sermon. If you didn't hear it, you can go online and, and look at it. Gene did an awesome job communicating that. But this is where Jesus turned the world's definition of greatness upside down. And he says, if you want to be great, guess what? You've got to serve others. Humble yourself. Especially serve those that maybe you don't uh, agree with. And maybe they're lower on the pecking order, so to speak. Those are the ones you need to serve. So with that in mind a little bit, we're going to jump into verse 42, this continuing conversation. Stumbling block is kind of what I labeled this point. Word says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in him, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. So there's some people, <clears throat> and there's, there's great biblical scholars on either side of this. Some interpret this passage to say that Jesus wasn't referring to a literal child, like the one he held in verse 36 of Mark 9, but rather on verse 31, if you look at that context, he's referring to anyone who belongs to him, so a believer. While others interpret little ones to mean a literal child. So there's always, I feel this tension in scripture where you're like, okay, is that symbolic of something? Is it literal? So just a little bit of research you can do. There's a Greek word here for little ones. I'm not a Greek scholar. It's just the research I did. It's mikros, and that can mean younger, a child, someone that's lesser, a quality of humbleness, or a lowly person. So do you see both there? Uh, it, it's kind of interesting. So anyway, however you dissect that, I think there's a lesson for us real quick that we can learn here, is as a Christ follower... We are called to be his ambassador, not a stumbling block. So I want to read a scripture to you. And when I read this scripture, I want you to think about how do I look at people? Do I look at people through my human eyes or through God's eyes? So this is 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. 
This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. I'm going to pause there. Maybe you needed to hear that this morning. Maybe you're still living with past mistakes or you think your past defines you. In Christ, you're a new creation. You've got to hear that. So continuing on, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us, insert your name there if you're a believer this morning, this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, that's you, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. If that doesn't blow your mind a little bit this morning, you're, and you're taking that for granted, maybe you need to step back. You are God's plan A on this earth to spread the good news. There's no plan B. It's us. And he picks you. It's pretty amazing. Think about this too. As a Christ follower, especially when it comes to fellow God's family, that's how I look at you guys this morning. As Christ followers, we're called to encourage one another, not condemn one another. There's a, there's a scripture I want to bring up that speaks to this. And I'm going to give you the word this morning because the word's going to do its work. This is in Romans 14, and a little bit of context. In the Jewish culture, there were some strong views on what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, which days are more holy or more celebrated than others. And so this is what, this is what the word's telling us here. So it's just an example of food and days, but I want you to hear the stumbling block piece. I'm going to read this in verse 14. Accept other believers who are weak in faith. Don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, an example that the word gives us. One person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge them whether they fall or stand, or whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some of you think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And then I want to kind of go down a little bit further here. This, this really kind of gets, oh man, this, this should be a gut check for us. So in, in verse 11, or sorry, in verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And then further down in verse 13, it says, So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. We do have a responsibility uh, to, to our fellow believers, not non-believers, because how can we expect a non-believer to act like a Christian, right? If you think that this morning, that's not true. Anyway, another sermon. <laughs> when it comes to, uh, if I'm in, example, my wife, if I, if she sins against me, if, if she commits a sin and she's not acknowledging that, I have an obligation as a believer to lovingly, with grace and truth, point that out. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. What, what this is telling us is, man, why are we fighting about stuff that really doesn't matter? Like, th I see a unity piece here. But there's another scripture I want to read that really speaks to this encouragement. We should encourage one another. This is a really key verse for my life. It's Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. It says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Key for my life, man, we all got blind spots and... I can think of a time recently where <laughs> my wife said something to me in a moment that 
was really hard, and I had to really pray about it. And God was like, she absolutely was right. And, and she did that in love. But it, it was just one of those, those areas where, man, my wife encouraged me, and I should encourage her daily as well. Millstone. Kind of interesting. So some of us were like, oh, maybe for some of you this makes sense. For the original audience, it sure did. But check this out. Yeah, so it was a pair of stones used for grinding grain. Um, in Jesus' time, it, w- it, it was weighed over 3,000 pounds. Um, they actually used a donkey uh, most of the time to, yeah, there we go, to move this stone. And so Jesus is using this example of, man, if you cause someone to stumble, you should go ahead and just put that around your neck and throw yourself in the sea. It's like, wow. I mean, that's, Jesus has given us a strong warning. Why do you think he's doing that? Because Jesus uses every word intentionally. He wants to get our attention. Man, like we, we should live a life that backs up our faith in Christ. Think about it this way. Pastor Brandon Giddenden said this when I was in real life Texas. I'm like, oh, thanks, Brandon. He goes, don't wear the jersey of Jesus and drag his name through the mud. Man, we, we are his representative, and, and I should, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. It's not living a perfect life. We're not able to do that, but it's being conformed to his image. So a question for you and I, are you a stumbling block or a stepping stone? Are you a bridge or are you a barrier for people coming to know and follow Jesus? Are you an obstacle or an open door to your fellow believer? And then we're going to take some, some inventory here in a moment to really think, okay, where am I right now? Verse 43 through 48. Get ready, because Jesus uses some strong language, and I'm going to read it one more time briefly here. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. <laughs> it's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Please, this morning, don't cut off your foot. I don't have enough tourniquets here. (laughs) Yeah, a a few of you might. Here's what I want you to think about here, is Jesus is getting our attention about the seriousness of sin. Quote I want to share with you. It's not really attributed to one person, but it's so true. Sin takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. How many times, if you're honest, and man, I can think of spots in my life that I'm like, how did I get here? Like, I didn't plan on getting here, you know, so I, part of my um, experience with this is uh, I was a a police officer before I was a pastor, and I would talk with people in prison, someone I arrested, I remember one call where someone, it was a DUI crash, and this driver that was drunk killed another person. And here I am interviewing this guy, and he literally was right here of, I never anticipated, I never wanted to do this. Man, sin, whew, it's insidious. Think about this, too, about how sin works. Does it always show up as a devil with a pitchfork? Super enticing, isn't it? Let's be honest. You're like, that looks like fun. Maybe I should partake in that. And before you know it, you're like, how did I get here? You know, and so Jesus is being really graphic here because he really wants to, to dig down into how serious sin can be. Question, what are you willing to cut away in your life? Think about this. I want to point out something. In your bulletin, there's a, a series, the Conqueror series, and it's for men who struggle with sexual sin. Guys, if that is you this morning, Jesus loves you. He meets you right where you're at. You're not condemned. Are you willing to maybe get a little uncomfortable and go to that small group and get some help? I did before. I'm like, oh, the pastor had a problem with that? Absolutely. You guys got to know, <clears throat> Satan, the way he works is you're the only one, whatever your sin is, that struggles with that. 
he tries to lie to us. And then when you actually confess your sin to one another, when you put it in the light, they're like, you too, huh? Let me tell you where you can get some bread. <laughs> Jesus. So I just, I, I just want to encourage you. What, what is that sin you have that's maybe just, you're like, man, that tripped me up again. What are you willing to do to cut that away in your life? That's what Jesus is really digging down into in this scripture. Are you resisting sin or are you giving into it? When I think about this, I think about a time I did a water survival course in the military. And if anyone else in this room has done that, kind of freaky, huh? Got all your gear on, they throw you in a pool. They're like, good luck. <laughs> uh, I know someone in this room that has been through SEAL training. And so he's like, dude, you have no idea. It's like, go through that. <clears throat> But here, here's why I bring that up. And I've said this myself. Oh, I'm struggling right now with some sin. Are you, Kevin? Because I think you're just giving into it. A struggle is literally like in that water survival course. You're, you're, every piece of energy you have, you're trying to get oxygen. That's a struggle. And I think there's, there's this, um, for me in my life, it was actually being willing to say, you're right, Lord, that is sin and I'm sorry, and I want to own that sin. So I want to read Psalm 51 to you. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. See how David's owning that? My sin. For I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone I have sinned, and I have done what is evil in your sight. You, have, you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. And you have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins, remove the stain of my guilt. And here's really good news, because God does this. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. There's a, there's a scripture here in the New Testament I want to just point out, and, and for me, it's, it's such just a reminder of who I am in Christ. Romans 8, 1. So now, because of what Jesus has, has done for you on the cross through the shedding of his blood, forgiveness of your sins, his resurrection, so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death going to jump forward to verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind, it leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Isn't that good? And I'm actually going to jump forward even further. It's a read Romans 8. Read the whole chapter. It's so good. <clears throat> but I want to Amen. I want to jump forward to um, verse 10. This is really good news. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. It does. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, because of all of, of what Paul is saying here in Romans, in Romans 8, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do, your new creation. You know, when it comes to this scripture too, Jesus uses some strong language. He talks about hell. And this morning, this isn't going to be a sermon on hell, um, but it is a component of it. Here's what we have to remember when Jesus is using this language, because we have an eternal destination. It's heaven or hell. I, I'm not loving you if I don't tell you that. But we have to remember what the heart of God is, and it's for all to have eternal life with him. But guess what? He gives us a choice. He gives us free will. He didn't create us as robots. That's not what a loving father does. 
And so think about this. If love is forced, it's not love. If we're free to choose God, we're also free to reject him. And his, God's ways are not our ways. You know, I just think, well, Lord, why didn't you just make us like robots? That would have been easier. Well, God does not think the way we do. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So there's a scripture that really speaks to this. It's Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Notice how it says turn to God. Does anything there say clean yourself up first? doesn't turn to him now and the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time because there i see we don't have tomorrow guaranteed we just don't there's a there's i'm going to throw some quotes at you because these these men have communicated this so well c.s lewis says this in his book the great divorce there are only two kind of people in the end those who say to god thy will be done and those to whom god says in the end thy will be done all that are in hell choose it and without that self-choice there could be no hell jesus uses this word hell in the new testament many times he uses it um, 12 times he says gehenna and it's derived from a hebrew phrase and it means valley of hinnom so it's really interesting why he used this again the original audience would have understood this much better than you and i Gehenna is an actual ravine or valley just outside of Jerusalem. And this valley was a very evil place, had an evil reputation. If you go back to the Old Testament in 2 Kings uh, chapter 16, specifically verse 3, and then in chapter 21, verse 6, we see King Ahaz and Manasseh. Guess what they did? They sacrificed their own kids there to a false god, this god of, of fire. So when Jesus is using this word Gehenna, so right now in your mind, think about when you picture hell, what do you picture? Because each of us kind of pictures something. And I, I've been realizing, I read a book on uh, this last week by Francis Chan called Erasing Hell. And he made a really good point in that book about, man, our view of hell, if we're honest, for a lot of us, is more, um, we get that version of hell from culture and not the word of God. Like, what does the word of God say? So right now, I, and I, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but I just want you to, when you picture hell, what do you picture? Some ugly stuff, fire, absolutely. So here, Jesus is talking to these people, and they know the history of this valley. They know there was child sacrifice that happened there. He's like, that is, that is what I want you to think about, about hell. He's using terrifying language because he wants to get our attention. Why? To condemn us? No, because he loves us. And he's like, oh, follow me, please. Here, and this is what struck me, and I'm like, thank you, D.L. Moody, for saying this, because, and I'm, this is in all honesty, this is how I feel as I preach about this. He says this, D.L. Moody, no one should ever preach on the topic of hell without a tear in his eye. Man, I, I just, one of my things I've seen is just a complete lack of this at times in our culture where you're going to hell. Okay, well, we do need to tell people the truth about eternity, right? But what about heaven? What about the good news? Man, we, we got to be careful here. You know, to promise heaven and not warn of hell is to offer forgiveness without repentance. And I think about this. Um, yeah, the to promise heaven and not warn of hell is to offer forgiveness without repentance. And when I really think about, man, there's this tension here because how often can you and I just think about the love of God and his mercy and grace, which is true and it's good, but what about the justice of God and his holiness? So I see the love of God and the justice of God meet at the cross. And this is, this is just uh, one of those verses that it's a small verse, but it's so deep. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, 
to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's really good news. And sometimes, and I just want to insert this because, man, talking about hell, I get it's a little heavy. I want to really get back to, that's a reality, but there's an essential gospel message that we need to communicate to people. This is one of those where if you're like, what, what's maybe a verse I can give somebody I'm, I'm trying to witness to? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I passed on to you what was most important and what also had been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. Mic drop. <laughs> he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. And that can really open up a conversation. There's another piece to this scripture. I don't know if you noticed, but there's some salt. There's some talk about salt. So in 49 and 50, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Okay, we get salt, but this original audience would have understood this a little better than you and I. So in the first century, um, salt had different uses. One of the uses, and we still do this today, was to like preserve food, to preserve meat. So putrefaction, what that is, is man, have you ever like, <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, I hate it when I do this. You get like a good cut of meat. I remember getting some steaks one time and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to have that this week. And I forget and I open up the fridge and you smell it. Isn't that the worst? Like you get a good T-bone and you're like, ugh. That's that putrefaction happening. So at this time in the first century, you know, they would use salt to rub into the meat, to help it, you know, be preserved. So one of the ways we can look about this is Jesus is saying that we as Christians should be salt. And think about as that putrefaction happens in the meat and that, like, infection spreads. Think about that as, like, evil in our world. That we should do what we can to help that spread from happening. We should spread the cure, not the infection. Christians, you and I, we should actually be a preserving influence in our world that's decaying. Our culture is going down the tubes. Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 5. I'm going to bring this up. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. This is who you are this morning in Christ. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. So think about this, too, with salt. Remember the last time you went to a movie and you had that big old tub of popcorn? What does it do when you eat that? It makes you super thirsty, right? Yeah. So salt should also, uh, it creates and it simulates thirst. So think about this. Man, as we share the good news and we back it up with our changed life, it should be attractive to people. They're like, man, you just, you treat me differently. When everyone else looks down on me, you give me value, you give me respect. Like, I'm thirsty. Like, wh what, what, I want what you have. So we should, as, as Christians, we should actually, when we enter a room, we should elevate that conversation. So, <laughs> one of the things that just has been so funny to me is, okay, when I was a trooper, I, there was a level of respect for most people with me, uh, but still, I, I would walk into a room and, you know, coarse language, I get all that. Man, it's so funny when I'm in a setting now and, you know, people are, pick your curse word and they're dropping it and dropping that, and then it comes in. What's, what's one of the questions people usually ask us in a conversation? What do you do? I'm a pastor. Ugh. <laughs> Their face gets red and I'm sorry about that, you know. And I just, I bring that up because, man, we're salt. Exactly. We should elevate the conversation. Man, we should restrain ethical corruption. We should promote honesty. We should raise the moral atmosphere in our culture because that's who you are. You're a new creation. Part of being his ambassador, it's talking the talk and it's walking the walk. It's living a changed life. And this is where um, I really just want to encourage you is don't, don't live on your mistakes. Don't live when, man, if you've, if you've sinned, I've sinned today. Let's be honest. In, in my mind, absolutely. 
I'm not saying live a perfect life, but be reminded you're being conformed to his image. You're being conformed to the image of Christ. Philippians 1, 6 says this, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The world is paying attention to us. And my prayer is, as you see me up here on this stage this morning, and you see me at Walmart, you catch me on the trail riding my dirt bike, you see me at my home, I'm the same person. I'm not, it's living that life of integrity. And the world's paying attention to us, church. Uh, Billy Graham says this, <clears throat> we are the Bibles the world is reading, we are the creeds the world is needing, we are the sermons the world is heeding. It goes back to it again. Like Pastor Brandon said, don't wear the jersey of Jesus and drag his name through the mud. How often have you and I, and, and I get, <clears throat> there's part of this that, People just use this as, as an excuse to not engage with God. But you hypocrites, you Christians, you act just like me. There's some truth to that, and it can sting a little bit. But we need to be his ambassadors, his representatives. When I was in the, in the military, and I had my not only the American flag patch on, but my unit patch, guess what? I represented that organization, that unit. You and I, as his ambassadors, we represent Christ. Yeah. That should spur us to, to maybe change some things in our life. So part of this, this morning, I, would, I just want to encourage you with, this is the step of action that God was really pushing me to communicate, is go share your faith. And with that, go disciple somebody. And Jesus commands us to do this. It's not a suggestion. It's not like, well, when you're a pastor, when you're an elder, when you whatever, then you can go, No. You Christian, day one, you can share your faith. That's why, and I just want to point to it, our vision and mission, reaching the world for Jesus one person at a time. That's evangelizing. That's sharing the good news. And then the mission to make biblical disciples in relational environments. That's the great commission. So I want to read this to you. It's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, Christian... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in my opinion, I think this starts in your family. So share the gospel in your family and make disciples, your workplace, your neighborhood, into all the world. Maybe God is calling you into a different part of this world. Awesome, but I think it starts in the home and in your neighborhood. Think about maybe this. You and I have been put in this world, in this part in the Silver Valley at this time for a reason. And God gives us a sphere of influence with people. Maybe you're that person that God put in this area right now to reach this other person. And just look for that opportunity. He works he works through you. The primary way God has chosen to reach people is through other people. And the primary way he works through people is through the verbalization of the gospel and then them watching your changed life. So remember this in Romans 10, 14 and 15. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never even heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. And as a Christian, you have been sent to bring the good news. And when it comes to this, this is where I'm really, <laughs> get ready for a little bit of a two by four across your forehead, because it hit me. As God the Father cares for everyone, so should we. As a Christian, we should have a compassion for the lost. If we don't, oh, Lord, change my heart. Because here we can see God's heart in Ezekiel 18, 23. This is God speaking. Do you think that I like to see wicked people die, says the sovereign Lord? Of course not. I love how the NLT is just so blunt there. Exclamation point. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. So I want to introduce a video for us to watch. And as God has a caring heart for everybody, so should we.
This man you're going to see, his name's Penn Gillette. Anyone remember Penn and Teller? The, the magicians, and they do comedy and stuff. Penn's the big guy. The teller was the little guy that never spoke. Might not know this about uh, Penn, but he is an ardent atheist. What you're going to see here is someone being an ambassador to Christ to this man. So check out this video. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and, you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the, um, what I call the hover position after I was all done, big guy, probably about my age. Big guy. And um, he had been the, um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. Uh, so he had the props from that in his hand because we'd give those away. He had the, you know, the joke book and the, and the envelope and the paper and stuff. If you haven't seen the live show, I, uh, it's not worth explaining. But he had props from the show that we'd given him from the night before. Uh, he wasn't the guy that night. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show, and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon Pocket Edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little book about this big, and this thick. And he said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of... Uh, proselytizing and then he said I'm a businessman I'm I'm sane I'm not crazy and he looked me right in the eye and did all of this and uh, it was really wonderful I believe he knew that I was an atheist But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, but that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible which had written in it a little note to me uh, not very personal but just you know like your show and so on and then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch now I know there's no God and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that uh, but I'll tell you he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep 
of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> see God working on his heart? Do you see the tension there? But you're, what did he say? How much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them this good news? Gosh. So if you're feeling a little convicted, welcome to the party. But honestly, um, it, it's so interesting to me how God uses people, even people that aren't his follower. Penn Jillette didn't know he was going to preach probably one of the best five-minute sermons <laughs> here in real life this morning. But God uses those situations. So here's kind of just what I want to encourage you with is, do you not feel qualified to share the good news? Okay, if you kind of feel that tension, that's good. That's some humility. God's not looking so much for ability as he is for a availability. Like, Lord, help me see guys like Penn that, man, maybe he, he says some pretty visceral stuff against Jesus, but you know what? I'm going to still witness to this guy because you care for him, so should I. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Think about this statistic, super sobering. 95% of Christians never lead another person to Christ. Let's change those numbers for the better. And he wants to use you. Another one to think about, this is from George Barna. He says about 25% of the adults in the U.S. would go to church if a friend would just invite them. He goes further, he goes, the best chance of getting them into church is when someone they know and trust invites them and then offers to accompany them. Maybe that's you this morning. I see some new faces here this morning. Maybe you had a friend that cares enough for you is like, please come to church with me. It's a good thing. So invite somebody and come to church with them. I just, I want you to think about this. Build a bridge with somebody, don't burn one. Build a bridge with somebody, don't burn it. You notice that interaction that Penn had with that man? Did he say this guy came in and he just, he yelled at me and said I'm a sinner and how did he approach him? Well, with caring love. Now, yeah, as that conversation progresses, can, is could there be some strong parts of the conversation? Absolutely. But he approached that man with God's love. I would encourage you, read um, John chapter 4, with the woman at the well. It's a perfect template from Jesus on how to share the good news with somebody. So check out that. We don't have time this morning for that. But here's the best way you can engage somebody is with a dialogue, not a monologue. Start a conversation. It's build that relationship. It's what Jesus does. He has the perfect blueprint in Scripture. We need to emulate that. Think about this, too. No one's been argued into the kingdom of God. <laughs> it just it doesn't happen. Colossians 4, 6 tells us this. I wanted to read this. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Be friendly, engaging, and caring. And think about this, too. There's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to sharing the good news and evangelism. We, we need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit on how he has us engage with this person. But really, for me, it's humility. We're just beggars telling another beggar where to find bread. We should never come off as that holier-than-thou Christian. It's not who you are. Remember Ephesians 2.8. God saved you and I by his grace when we believed and we can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. It's only because of, of Jesus. Man, it's that free gift of salvation. As a disciple of Jesus, he says, I will now make you, what, a fisher of people. So this is a really interesting term, and I'm going to show you a book here at the end. It's called Spiritual Chumming. You ever chum for fish? Yeah. Yeah. So what this means is if you are engaging with somebody, make a spiritual point and see if they respond. So, man, I, God really worked in my life in this area. Or, man, the word talks about what's going on in our life right now. Some people are just going to ignore you or get mad or whatever that is. But someone else might go, what did you mean by that? And you're like, oh, I got to hit on the line. <laughs> 
And I'm just using fishing as an analogy, so it kind of helps us. Use tact. That's defined as an intuitive knowledge of saying the right thing at the right time. What's another way we can communicate that? Rely on the Holy Spirit. He, he's going to guide you and give you the words. Here, for me, is probably the, the, one of the best equipping tools I'm going to give you this morning. It's the power of your personal testimony, of your story. Every single one of you has a story, and it's valid because it's your story. And think about this. There's someone out there that just needs to hear your story because they can relate to you. A person can argue with you, and I'm sure Penn does when he talks with Christians. He might argue about certain facts, but he can't argue with you about how you came to faith in Christ. It's your story, and it's powerful. Your testimony can build a bridge because you can actually find some common ground with that person that you're sharing with. Here's where I just want to really nail this down. There's a British preacher, C.H. Spurgeon, said this. He, he was once asked, if you could put your testimony of your Christian faith, what would it be? And he goes, I could sum it up in four words. Jesus died for me. That'll open up a conversation. Well, what do you mean he died for you? Why would he die for you? Why, what? Jesus died for me. Think about that. Maybe that's a way you can start with sharing your testimony. Real quick, when it comes to sharing your testimony, don't glorify or exaggerate your past. Just tell the truth about your past and your present. Don't boast about your work. Boast about Jesus' work. Think about this. You and I gave up nothing in comparison to what Christ gave up to save our souls. We need to emphasize that when we share our story. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Christ. The point of your story, your testimony, is so you can tell people about his story, his love for humanity, his death on the cross, his resurrection. And, and man, when the woman at the well there, I, I shared that scripture to read, told her story about his, her encounter with Jesus, what did she do? She pointed to Jesus. And as a result, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. As we tell our story, I pray something similar would happen. It's sharing that essential gospel message, you know, know how to share the good news, and, and we can, man, there's many people in the church that if you're wanting to know how to do that, we want to help you. There could be a point in the conversation where, like Penn talks about this, about getting uncomfortable. You might have to get uncomfortable and ask that pointed question. Who do you say Jesus is? Are you ready to follow him? And then, man, for those who accept the good news, and not all will, and that's not on you at all. Hear, hear my heart. When, when you're trying to share the gospel with somebody and they reject that message, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. And so for those that accept the good message, guess what? Is that the finish line? No. Now you have an opportunity to disciple them. And, and this morning, you know, we don't have time for a conversation about discipleship. But think about this. You and I... We overcomplicate discipleship. We try to put it into a box. It's a lifestyle we live. It's who we are. A disciple of Jesus is who you are. It's through intentional everyday actions and relationships. And it's intentionally coming alongside another person to help them grow in their spiritual maturity, to be more Christ-like. Such a privilege to do so. And so at the end of this, with discipleship is a disciple of Jesus who makes other disciples of Jesus. It's that reproducible process. It's the mission. And so I just want to encourage you. Um, Pastor Gene and I and other leaders in our church, we would love to help equip and encourage you to be his ambassador and to disciple other people. Man, I, I just been praying like some people will respond to this, you know. And I want to give you some resources. So one book I would highly recommend, it's by Greg Glory. it's Tell Someone, You Can Share the Good News. It's about 100 pages, um, it's an easy read, super well done, some great equipping tools, and I brought a few into the sermon today. And we actually do, um, a few times a year, we'll actually do a small group on this. So you can go online and pick one up, um, however you want to do that, go to the sewer store in Coeur d'Alene. And then there's another thing I want to just give you as an equipping tool. And this is out at the connecting point on the table. 
It's a piece of paper, double-sided. It's 30 minutes to share, uh, 30 minutes to a shareable testimony. And it actually helps you step by step on actually writing out your testimony. If you've never done that, do it. It's so, so, so good. And just remember, it starts with Jesus died for me. Let's pray. Uh, Lord God, I, I thank you. Just as, as Brian started us with that prayer this morning, that you call us out of darkness and into light. God, that, that, that we're reminded of that free gift of salvation. It's not something that we can earn at all. And Lord, you have called us to be salt and light in the world. And so Lord God, I, I just pray you would remind me to, to continually look for opportunities to share the gospel with people. And it starts for caring for them. So even this morning, Lord, Penn Jillette, to this day, still an atheist, I see you working on his heart. And, and Whoever that difficult person is in our life, and we can all picture them right now that doesn't know Jesus, would you soften our heart towards them? And just remind us, Lord, um, of how good you are and your heart is for all. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then uh, Elder John Cook is going to lead us through communion. All right. Thanks, Kevin. All right. If the servers want to start um, getting communion ready, and, um, and passing that out, uh, they certainly can. Um, I know Kevin led us through some directed prayer um, before start of the message, and we're going to take just a moment. Again, um, if there's anything that God's put on your heart, anything that um, God has, uh, has been working on you, uh, maybe there's that person, uh, maybe there's that family, maybe there's that... Um, that, uh, that Aaron, your wife, is like, man, you know, they're those people in your life because I want you to be the one to talk to them. Um, let's just take a moment to bring those things before God. So I, I love it when I get to do communion because I love that reminder that, that communion is of what Christ did on the cross. I mean, as, as Kevin just got done talking about, you know, um, the evil of sin and how corrupting it is in our life. Thank you. How, um, how, how terrible hell is that that he is our solution, that Jesus is the solution to this problem, or Jesus is the, is the way that we make ourselves right with God because of what he did on the cross, because of who he was, not because of what I've done, what I can do, what, I, what, what, what power I think I have, but because of what he did on the cross, what he accomplished, because he was perfect, because he was blameless, because he was God's son, and he said, I'm going to take John's sin, I'm going to take that sin on me and pay the price for that so he doesn't have to pay the eternal price. And he goes, I want a relationship with John and with you and with, with everyone in this world so much that he was willing to go through that. And so we remember that. We remember what he did and we, and we, and we thank him for what he did. And, and then hopefully we then go and tell people what he did for them. So um, I'm going to take a moment and we're going to read uh, a little passage and we're going to take communion together. Um, I'm going to pray, um, and then we'll have one more song um, before we leave. And then there'll be a couple of us up here. If you do have anything you want to pray about, anything you want to talk to God about, um, we would love to talk to you about that. If you don't understand, what's he talking about? Sin and, 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 
and why do I need a Savior, or, or how do I accept Him? Please find me, find Pastor Kevin, find one of the other elders. Uh, we would love to talk to you about what that, what that means. So um, I love in Matthew, so this is the, the uh, when Jesus is, is talking to His disciples before He's about to be crucified, and, and he's, he's kind of trying to explain to them about what's happening, and then he, he leads them through the Lord's Supper, and He says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat, for this is my body. So let's take the body together, or bread together, remember Christ's body broken for us. And then in verse 27 it says, And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Let's take the cup together and remember Christ's blood shed for us. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you for um, your son and the life he lived um, and the disciples that he made um, and his death on the cross. Lord, I'm so thankful that you gave us your Holy Spirit. When we accept who you are, Lord, you, you gave us a part of you of your spirit to live in us and to guide us and lead us and to teach us and to, to point us towards you. And Lord, I pray that we can take that gift, we can take that, um, that, uh, that, that great thing that you've given to us, Lord, and we will be willing to share it with those around us, share it with our family, share it with our coworkers, share it with um, people we see, Lord, that, it, that it's lived out in our life, that it's lived out in our actions. It's lived out in, in all that we do, Lord, because, because you are Lord, because you are the one who should guide our life. You're the one who should lead us in everything that we do. Lord, we love you and we trust you. Amen. Go ahead and stand as we finish the service out together, singing about the great name of Jesus.
to send you out with this. This is these are your orders from the king. You ready? All right. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's walk in the walk, talk in the talk. Bless you, church. Have a great day.